For the past eight seasons of AFL Fantasy and Supercoach, Zach Merritt has given us a 100-plus average. Can he make it nine consecutive years? History, trends, and what we forecast Essendon to do would give coaches plenty of confidence that he's just going to chalk up another ton average in 2024. But when should we jump on the Essendon captain? We will talk about that in today's episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. We're at number 21 of my 50 Most Relevant. The players I've put in a rank and in an order that I believe we must have conversations and we must consider for AFL Fantasy Supercoach and for Dream Team in 2024. Joining me on this episode, as he has ever since we started the Coaches Panel, he's a fellow co-founder. He won Dream Team back in 2020, and I can't wait to get his take on Zach Merritt. Ritz, good to have you back on the podcast. He's such a consistent player and such a fascinating fantasy prospect for 2024. And he's also one of those guys we seem to always be able to jump on at some point through the year at a, a slightly lesser value than what he starts at. And I think we're going to go down that path today. So let's have a go, mate. If we look at his Supercoach season last year, that was a career-high Supercoach year. It was a seasonal average of 116.3. means he's at a price point where he's just over 650K. 15 tonnes, a career-high top score last year, a 168. While over in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, a 112.8 seasonal average means we are paying seven figures for him across both of those two formats. 15 tonnes last Last year, 158 was his season high score, but it's just a little bit skinny of his career high, which is 172. He's just one of these fantastic players to watch. Ever since 2016, during an era of the Essendon Football Club that they do not want to speak about, he's just been incredibly durable, incredibly consistent. This guy runs all day. He finds a way to get into space and takes on the game with his kicking, his beautiful use of hands, gets out into space, takes uncontested marks, but he's not just an outside pony. This is an inspirational leader for the Essendon Football Club. Gets in and under, down and dirty, farming clearances and contests out to his teammates, willing them to come alongside and stand up with him to try to get his Bombers back into the finals mix. You can say what you want about Zach in his career, but one thing you can't say in any kind of negative light is he is all effort, he is all in. And as you mentioned, Rids, at some point in this season, we're going to want him in our fantasy side. The one thing that he does do for me is I don't think I've own someone I've enjoyed watching as much as Zach Merritt when he's going. Like, when he goes, that ceiling is just incredible. It goes through the tens. You know, he'd go 110, 120, 130 at such a quick rate, especially when the game progresses. It's just incredible. And it's it just doesn't seem like it's going to stop at times. He's a phenomenal scorer. He's a great player to watch and own. He is top 10 in the league last year for uncontested possession, second overall, sixth for effective disposals and 10th for disposals per game. But from a fantasy football perspective, AFL fantasy and dream team, that 112 average and 15 tons, well, half of those seven, so a little bit under half, uh, were 120 plus, five of them monsters over 140 and three 150 plus scores and didn't drop his scoring under 80 for us last year. So the concern we've had about his basement and his scoring floor, he certainly in AFL fantasy corrected that for us last year. Ranked eighth overall for points and sixth for average. So top 10 performer across every single metric we can look for. While over in Supercoach, career high average of 116.3, 15 tons. And the conversion of hundreds to games that he could be a VC and C option for him, nine 120 plus scores, eight over 130. And we talk about monsters. Twice last year, this guy went 160 plus and only once dropped his scoring under 88, which was a 69 all season top 10 for overall points sixth for averages and his consistency of scoring is really unmatched in almost every possible metric you can look forwards eight seasons of consecutive plus scoring we'll talk in a few moments about the timing of when we should be targeting zach 
But the reality is, if you were to be saying, put a Mars bar on a player that injury pending is a absolute lock to average 100 plus across all of the formats in 2024, you'd be looking at Zach and go, I feel like my Mars bar is pretty safe. Yeah, you're not wrong. And he just, he's just amazing, like with that sort of style and that sort of, once upon a time, he was really susceptible to a tag, but he seems to work through it now. Like there was times last year that he had someone hanging off him, but he just kept running and going into contests and coming out of contests with the ball. And the way that he uses it by foot is second to none in the league, in my opinion. Well, he finds a way that when he does get these tags last year, we saw that in round 22 when Caden Turner went to him. Historically, there's your 50. There's your floor game. He still went 90 plus in that game. Round 13, so a couple of months earlier, Carlton sent Kerno to play this lockdown hard tag role on him after he had a hot stretch of three or four weeks. What does he do? Gets severely impacted in the first half, but by halftime, the coaching staff move him towards half forward and becomes a real catalyst for how this team's success then pops through the next couple of weeks. And while he didn't go nuts with a huge score, he didn't get killed by the scoring. So you're right, he's found a way to work through these hard tags. But there's a couple of questions I want to ask you, Rids. And the first one, and we'll talk about the timing of trading into him in a moment. The first question for me is, how does this Essendon midfield mix Look, he had a center bounce attendance jump last year. It was 68% in 2022. It was up at about 80, by the way, in 2021. But he went up to 74% CBAs last year. How does this work? Parrish, we know when he's in, he's going to be around there. Will Setterfield spent some time injured last year, but he was a center bounce midfielder. Dylan Shield historically has rolled through there. Jake Stringer, they've liked for some burst and speed and dynamic change. And then you've got, a couple of kids that are rolling through there. Jai Caldwell, maybe a stretch to call him a kid, but you've got a Ben Hobbs and also an Elijah Sardis. How do you see this midfield mix spilling out and what could be the fantasy impacts for Zach Merritt in 2024? The other one that you didn't mention was Perkins. Like he yes. actually spent a lot of time in there and doing accountable type roles. I tell you what, mate, I have no idea. I don't think anyone knows, especially with the actual additions of Gresham. And then Dersmer out on the wing, which may push Durham into the inside role a little bit more as well. No one's got actual any idea how this is going to work. Yeah, there's so many possibilities how this goes. It's just crazy. I think the beauty is we do get to see a little bit through the preseason um, and make some moves from there. And that Zach, even when he is off a flank, whether it be a halfback or a half forward, I, I don't see him pushing out to a wing. He's gut running, his ability to get involved in the contest, his link up play, because I still see him as the best ball user in this Essendon side. Even if he does slightly fade a little bit from a center bounce presence, is his ability to get in and around the ground should mean that we see this scoring, which is consistently 100 plus across the formats, hold for us yes I think we, yeah I think what i was going to say was because we're uncertain about how that essendon mix looks then we should be leaning to is wanting to see that in season before we go working out when we jump on so i just think due to that plus i mean i'm, I'm sure you're going to highlight the round one potential matchup at some point in time Due to that, I think we've got a little bit of an avenue to actually upgrade to him. So maybe we rule him out as a starter just for now. Some things may change along the way where it becomes a lot more clearer. But just for now, I think the idea would be let's plan on upgrading to him at some point. Now, let's try and identify that. And that round one matchup, I mean, we've talked about it previously. Finn McGuinness tag is... If he's named, he's 100% going to go to Zach. And I can tell you now, he's definitely tagging in the midfield if he's playing Finn McGuinness. There's no problems about that. We're already seeing a Blake Hardwood go forward this year. Yep. So there is potential that he's going to have a little bit of a lockdown forward type role. So it will be Finn McGuinness in the midfield like he did last year. Yeah, We saw mm -hmm. it with Clayton Oliver. We've seen it with Dacos. We've seen it a few times through. There. Zach Merritt's got to be the guy that you go to in that Essendon field, midfield. 
A hundred percent. If you're locking down, it's there. I know some would look at a Zach Merritt and, and it, the premium midfielders are, are an interesting thing. Like if, if you genuinely try to pick who could be top 10 midfielder for across the season, you can really comfortably throw 20 names into the, the basket and go, Oh yeah, that could work. That could work. And so Zach does give some level of confidence to coaches that are a low risk profile of how they like to build their starting squad. They just go eight years of hundred plus finds a way to get it done year in year out. I'll just start it and I'll bank those ceiling games and cop the odd tag that comes my way. I understand that. But given the 40 trades we have in Supercoach and Dream Team now and the way AFL Fantasy has always worked with the weekly price movements, to me, with that early tag, I, I really am probably looking to fade, as you've mentioned him. But when do we get on to Zach? That's the key thing. So, Ritz, you've done some great work for us. Is it about an upcoming fixture? that you see a trend of the right point to jump on him, either because of some tough matchups or an opening of some nice ones that come his way. So I reckon about Anzac days where you're looking at, at this point in time. Round he's seven, got, yep. Round seven. So pretty much you get through that Hawthorne, you get through Port Adelaide, and then you jump through Adelaide as well, and then you enter Collingwood. Suddenly you go Collingwood, West Coast, GWS, which is slightly difficult, North Melbourne, Richmond, Gold Coast, and then Carlton going into the bye. And then straight out of the bye, you hit West Coast again. <laughs> so it's like a double whammy there. It just jumps out at the page at me. And last year, we saw this, okay? When we looked at Zach Merritt last year, we were able to put a little circle around one of the matchups. And he came out and went 150, nearly back to back. It was almost 150 score, 150, two weeks out of three, one after the other last year. So that's what he can do if you time it right. And with trading, it's always about timing in it. Yeah, MJ? hundred percent is well fit in McGuinness tag. You can probably, again, if he's named round one, you can lock McGuinness heading to merit round four, Port Adelaide using 2023 data, which is all we can use. Willem Drew did play those accountable moments and Port were quite restrictive to score against because they denied opposition the opportunity just to play free-flowing ball movement football. They locked that game in real tight. So if that game style A holds and Drew B goes to him, now you've got two games in that first month of football that's going to impact that scoring, take that price point right down to hit that beautiful stretch of games that Rids you've just alluded to pre-buy and, and post-buy, it's actually historically a really good spot. Of the matches that they play there, there's only one game where they actually move outside of Marvel Stadium or the MCG. And over Zach's career, there's just four teams in AFL Fantasy and six teams in Supercoach that he doesn't have a career average of 100+. plus. Of those teams in AFL Fantasy, he only plays one of them after the buy, that's Geelong. And in Supercoach, he only plays two of them, Geelong and Adelaide. So everything, you're right, Rids, is pointing to upgrade, and I'm with you. If you can make him as a priority, as one of your first midfield upgrade moves at round seven or at some point through that stretch, you're absolutely going to enjoy the ride. So what you'll find, though, is that round seven matchup is also going to be about when we want to jump on a Nick Dacos as well. So Correct. it's going to take a little bit of time, a bit of managing around things. If you haven't started with Nick Dacos, that's around that ballpark figure, okay? That round seven. Same conversation with Merritt, yeah? Mm. So... The problem we got then is how do we upgrade to two of the most expensive players in their formats at the same point in time? And that's going to be the tricky part. So have we made enough money? Have we generated? Do we have something in a stepping stone that we can get to these players in? So you're going to have to plan this. I, so I, think, that's that's a, I think that's an important point for us to just take another moment to settle on is because when we're building these starting squads, we have this utopian idea of when we landmark a trade, I'll get a Dacos here. I'll get a merit here. I'll get an English here. I'll get a whoever there, but so many variables pop and encounter during the season. So does a merit, if that priority is 
I want him at round seven. Does that lend itself for you to prioritize starting with the day cost? Because in AFL Fantasy, you've only got the two trades that week. At least in Supercoach and Dream Team, you can activate the boost if you've got the avenue to cash generation that you alluded to. But how do you prioritize the two? And does that impact your starting squad selection at all? I think it has. Well, I think it has to, mate, really, because you're going to have to put, like I said this um, a couple of months ago now, you've got to find your little pockets in that draw where it actually suits you to get to that next person. Now, it might mean that you have to start someone that you would normally not be thinking about, you know? Right. And let's just use it as an example in the midfields right now. It might be the guy, one of the guys I did a few months ago in Cam Guthrie, yeah. like in the It might mean that that actually works well to go Cam Guthrie to a Zach Merrick. It might mean someone like a Windhager might be an option to get to a day cost. So it's not only working out when you're going to get them, how Mm. you're going to get there, because you're going to need someone with some substantial coin about them to actually be jumping from to get these guys. Yeah, it's really, really good. Look, at some point in 2024, you're going to want to own Zach Merritt. There's a world where it's a justifiable way where you bank him at round one. You know you'll cop the odd small score, but you're elevating the profile of opportunity to get those big 140, 150, 160 plus scores. Merritt's always had ceiling, but his frequency of ceiling in 2023 found a whole new level. So if you just want to eliminate risk entirely and go, I want the 100 plus mid, I want every ceiling game. I don't want to miss it. And I don't care if I lose a little bit of value and cop the odd bad score. I just want to select it and walk away. Okay, that's all. That's a way of playing the game. Equally, there's a few little kind of just blips in the early radar that give me enough kind of concern to go, you know what? I might fade here because he opens up from Anzac Day onwards. And if I can get a little bit of things going my way as an upgrader that... Poor score in round one. A challenging matchup against Port Adelaide at round four. Yep, I'll jump on through. Yes, he'll help you through the first six buys, first six weeks um, where there's multiple buys. If you do start him, he's not in opening round. But for me, I look at what he's going to be from round seven onwards, and he's right at the top of my trade in priorities, along with a player like a Nick Dacos. Draft day gets interesting for me, though. Rids, that history, that consistency of 100 plus mids. It, it does not get away from the draft coach. That They see it and they go, I'm not going to fart around with a pick. I'm going to get him. Based on his seasonal average, he, he's a top 10 guy across the formats and he's an M1. I, I don't think anyone should be considering him as an M2. You're not going to get that lucky on draft day. But where does he go on draft? So Ritz, high pedigree, high ceiling, M1. Is it a first round pick or is he a second round selection for you? I think you're looking in the teens, around the teens, Mark. Now, I say teens very loosely because it could very well be 13 to 19 pretty much in that range. It's going to be a second-round pick. There's no doubt about that. Um, With the rucks, the way that they're situated right now, with a defender that's jumping off the screen at us, we've also potentially got a forward who depending on the preseason game and everything else has potential to go, or maybe even two of them, you know, over a hundred this year. And we don't seem to have a surplus of these guys. They might go a bit early as well. Someone like a Zach Merritt is nearly the first mid taken off the board due to that beautiful record. You've um, mentioned a second ago, mate. Yeah. Look, he's going to be a fantastic buy again for drafts and for classic owners. Rids, he's a fun player to look at. I think we're all at one point in time in 2024 going to want to own him. And we know it's going to be a really fun ride. Mate, thanks again for jumping on this episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Yeah, it's too easy, buddy. If you want to go and check out the article that sits alongside this episode, it's online for you now at coachespanel.tv. It dives into a little bit more of the data and the nuance that we've spoken about throughout this episode. There you can also find every other player we've revealed so far in the 50 most relevant. If you're loving these audio podcasts, wherever you find your podcast, you can find the Coaches Panel. Just simply search for it and then subscribe and leave a five-star rating. If you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a nice review. If you leave a great review, 
we'll probably read it out for you on an upcoming episode of the 50 Most Relevant. We'd love to give you a shout out. And new from us in 2024, we're doing these episodes on YouTube where you can go and watch and check them out. So if you haven't done that, make sure you go over, hit subscribe, got those notifications on. So as soon as a vep, an episode of the videos drops, you get an opportunity to check that out every single day this preseason. We're dropping a brand new episode. And uh, you can comment below and let us know what you think. Is Zach Merritt going 110 again? Or do you see a little bit of regression? Comment below with your thoughts on what you think he'll average in 2024. In under 60 seconds, I've got a clue for you about who's coming up next in the 50 most relevant. But if you haven't become a Patreon supporter of the coaches panel, we'd love you to get involved and do it. For just a few dollars a month, there is a bunch of different rewards that come your way through financially supporting the coaches panel. And depending on the tier you jump in, the greater the rewards that come your way. If you do love what you've got from us this preseason or over seasons prior, We'd love you to take a few moments, jump on, become a Patreon. We would greatly appreciate it. All the details for that and where you can get in touch with us across social media are in the description of this episode. So who's tomorrow in the 50 most relevant? He's a player that his relevancy spiked when one player requested and was moved during the free agency and trade period. But he was not the player that moved. He was the one that stayed. And don't think he's been left behind. Rather, this has created a beautiful pathway for us in the fantasy footy community that if we wanted a player at this price range, he makes it a very compelling case to jump on because this guy has shown in limited opportunities, he could be a beast for us. Who is this guy that has now inherited a beautiful opportunity that for us in the fantasy footy community, we're going to find it hard to say no to. Find out tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.